Welcome to the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. We're exactly one day before the world famous Not Your Average Investor Summit. We are. I'm your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, a man I like to call GC because of his genius concepts. He knows how to generate cash flow. And because his name is, he's a great co host. And because his name is Greg Cohen. So hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Great to be with you. And today, we're talking about a little known fact, which is, you know, people love, people love the sexy assets. They're like, I want to invest in homes. I want to invest in luxury homes by the beach. I want to invest in big commercial buildings. But guess what? One of the best assets to invest in is not that. It, yeah. It's workforce housing around the urban core, which is. It's not the sexiest neighborhoods, but your wealth is looking real sexy, mm -hmm. right? So, boring old single family rental properties. Boring old single family. In a neighborhood that you might not expect it. That's actually, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll so wait a little bit until we get into the show to tell you about some things. one of the there. surprises. Just one of the surprises of the show. No surprise. We've got the Not Your Average Investor Summit tomorrow. No surprise. You know it's sold out, but it's shaping up to be a doozy. We already got people rolling in town. I'm we getting do. a lot of messages. Very special people yeah. in town. Yeah, very special people. And guys, this is the culmination of, geez, I mean, I think this is the culmination of what we've been building for 18 years mm -hmm. at JWB and definitely for the last four years as we've been building our Not Your Average Investor community. And then for the last three to four years, as we've been making investments in downtown Jacksonville and geez, it's, it's going to be so special. So I can't wait. Our entire team is pumped. We're fired up and uh, we're one day away. So can't wait to see you all. And uh, speaking of people, we can't wait to see it is the folks that we honor in a time old tradition called what you said. The roll call, man. Oh, man. We got the early bird Dean Curry checking in, just landed in Jacksonville, man. That guy is. He's the early bird. A, tr a true early bird. He's still early first. Bird. Still first. He's going to be there first tomorrow, right? No. What time are you, are you camping out tonight or what? <laughs> <laughs> Lead off hitter batting second today. John Henning with a good afternoon. We got Laura Colby checking in from Washington State. Right. We got our favorite name to pronounce, Aaron O'Neill. Into, Into the light. light. I heard Aaron's I heard Aaron's voice talking to yeah. talking to Cody over the speakerphone. Greg and I looked over at us and both go. Uh, we got the mystery man and his mystery lady, Denny and Erica Davies. Welcome, guys. Oh, sorry, mystery man and Mrs. Man. <laughs> and route to the summit. Welcome. Good to have you. We got Leo Faraganan. Dun, 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 dun. Faraganan. Dun, 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 dun. Checking in from the Bay Area. My condolences to your 49ers, Leo. That was a, mm. that was a tough one. Mm. John Evans checking in with a good All afternoon. Right, John. John's back. Haven't heard from him in a while. The Shaman. Nadim Shah. Nadim Shah. Team Shaw checking in. Our amigo we were just hearing about. Mm -hmm. Bill Shields. That was your job there. Oh, well. Yeah. Know, well amigos. I didn't know. I didn't know when I was probably Great say, to see you, Bill. When I say amigo, you say Bill Shields. We got Jeff Petty John is back. Good to have you, Jeff. We got Stanley Jocelyn is checking All back right, in. Stanley. Coming back. Matthew Edwards from Virginia Beach making himself a regular as well. The first family of the Not Traveling Investor Show. Ken and Carolee Meline, Patriarch and Matriarch. We, we salute, salute you. you. We got Shaquille Ahmed. Shaquille is making. Shaquille. I think he was. A new... Are you in danger of becoming a regular, Shaquille? <laughs> in danger, I like it. Yes, you are definitely becoming a regular. We appreciate you. And you're a courageous new attendee turned regular, too, because you've said hello twice now in the chat. We appreciate you being here. Love it. We got the mother of the godmother of the of the fairy godmother of the Not Your Average Investor Show, world-famous author. Miss <laughs> Lydia Filson. Miss Lydia Filson in the house. Big Papa's in the house. We love it when he calls him Big Papa. Pops, how are you, my friend? The co-founder of the co-founder. Throw that, your hands in the air if you're a real say. player. That's not what I, I know. Said. I know. I, I buckle down. We got someone that we like to call around here <laughs> from the sadly summitless summits of Colorado. I can do that one, Bill. We got Elizabeth Butler in the house from Indianapolis. Elizabeth, is that a new name? I don't know, but I, I am know. excited I'm, that you're here. Elizabeth. Yeah, is excited. it a new name? Let us know. We're Elizabeth. excited. Welcome. Here. Someone checking in from California. If you checked in from your text, you got to just tell me who your name is. So it says, not your average guest from California. Good morning. Good morning to you. Marilyn Collerman, Cotterman from home in Sasa, Florida. That's the home of the manatees, Pablo. Home of the manatees. And speaking of the man, a T. <laughs> Yes. The, uh, there, there's someone. There's someone missing. There's someone yes, missing there's, in the roll call. Checked in yet. Someone that everybody's heard of. Oh, Katrina. It's Katrina from California. Good to have you, <laughs> Katrina. Someone. Someone missing that hasn't checked in yet. I wonder where he may be. Hmm. The most valuable 
MVP player. I feel like I heard a, I, a, a noticeable laugh somewhere off in the yeah, in the distance. Yeah, and it seemed to be getting louder like a train. Where could it be? Where could it be? <laughs> Come on over, big guy. There he is. We got Lee Bishop in the house, folks. The MVP doing what MVP thinks he does. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Jane, Jane is in the studio with us as well. We cannot we cannot not acknowledge her as well. What's up, buddy? You just We're crashing in. this party? We're ready to have a great time at this summit. It's on Lee. We're gonna we're gonna thank you for being here, and yes. uh, we're gonna bring you back a little bit later. So, what we are talking about here, right? The boring old single family home. Yes, we are. We like to refer to it as workforce housing because that is uh, uh, one one way that people refer to it. GC, when people ask you workforce housing, what does that even mean? Yeah, well, <clears throat> workforce housing has a definition, so we'll first start there. So. The Urban Land Institute defines workforce housing as housing that's available for folks that make between 60 to 120 percent of the area median income. And think about this as housing that's designed for many essential workers. So firefighters, police officers, teachers, right? Those folks that are so essential to our communities. This is the housing that is really geared and designed to provide for, for those folks. So if you start to put the numbers to it, just to kind of you know, let you know where that is in Jacksonville and show you how JWB plays a part in these types of neighborhoods. The median, the median income in Jacksonville is about $75,000. Mm -hmm. So putting that number 60 to 120%, that takes you to housing that's available for folks who make between about 45 mm -hmm. and $90,000. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where we have lived for 18 years. We have focused on that neighborhood, those types of neighborhoods. And we'll certainly get into the reasons why, but beyond just the wonderful things that it can do for wealth building and the investing angle, it's fun to support those essential workers. And I think many people miss that fact when they think about owning rental properties. There's, there may be a negative stigma that comes about it, yeah. but you're serving those who serve our communities to the greatest extent. Makes sense, GC. You know, I think of, I, I think of, what we talk about a lot on the show of like supply and demand. And I think about, you know, there's, and there's two sides of that, right? There's the supply of the housing, but there's also the supply of the residents. And, and then I think about, you know, so obviously at that income level, at that kind of like purchasing power, you're talking about people starting their career. You're talking about maybe young families that are, that are trying to get established and just like have, Normalcy, you're talking about some very respected careers of like nursing mm -hmm. and teachers and the military and people that we really, really, really appreciate out mm -hmm. here. And then I think about the macroeconomy of Jacksonville, right? The fact that we have this like very healthy medical sector that, so that employs a lot of that. We have a very healthy military population, right? Like kind of, I've, I've started to realize that we're, we're like we're like the third city when it comes to like the military industrial complex, right? People talk about Virginia and the DC area. They talk about San Diego, and then they talk about Jacksonville. Yeah. But they talk about that much less. I've just started to notice that. Yeah, it's good. I have I, you know, it's interesting. I've never really thought about us being the third city there, but you name those two, and you hear you often hear of those. I yeah, mean, we have two military bases that provide a significant amount of jobs here locally, and a third one that is just on the outskirts of of our MSA. So yeah, it's there's a lot uh, of uh, there's a lot of need to support housing in yeah. that what we call the missing middle. Yep. The missing middle is that area of housing where you know those essential workers and the you know those who make in Jacksonville between 45 to 90,000 dollars a year, you know, they're facing significant challenges especially due to home price affordability. Yep. And one thing that we haven't had the opportunity to shed as much light on as as we like is like you all at, by investing in single family rental properties are a part of that solution right there. Yeah, let's talk about the other side of the coin. The 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 beachfront housing, the the luxury homes that people would think about renting. Who lives in those? Well, those who earn more money, right? And so your high income earners are living out in neighborhoods with the last name Beach. If you're in Jacksonville, right? Think about those areas. And an easy way to understand what type of housing you're in, of beyond just the way it looks or maybe feels driving through a neighborhood, is to put some numbers to it. And so the median home price in Jacksonville right now is about $355,000. And so if you are, call it 
50% above that, you're at around maybe $550,000, give or take somewhere around there, right? But that would be your upper middle income housing in Jacksonville. And as you go up and up and up, you are in more and more of a luxury type of uh, a neighborhood. And, you know, if you're out by the beaches, you get into the millions uh, yep. here in Jacksonville. And I think of I think of people that have moved down here from New York that are in these like kind of like positions and they, they rent these homes, whether they're deciding to stay or not, those mm -hmm. kinds of different things. It feels like it's a different, you know, renting out by the beach versus renting a workforce family home. It's a, it's a different buying decision, isn't it? You mean from the renter's perspective? From the, yeah. From the resident's perspective. Uh, yes, definitely. Well, I mean, if you're a, if you want to live out by the beach, depending if you're going to rent or buy, you're going to have to pay a lot each month. And, you know, there's not as much rental demand out by the beaches yep. because people who live out by the beaches or in these luxury neighborhoods generally can afford to actually own their own home. And they understand that by buying their own home, it is the best decision financially over the long haul. And so if they have the wherewithal to do that, they do that. So inherently there's less rental demand in yep. those neighborhoods. And, you know, and this is a concept I'm sure we'll get to, which is that, that the rental demand in those luxury neighborhoods is not as strong, which leads to a lower rent to price ratio. And for the price of the home, the rents are just lower percentage basis out in the luxury neighborhoods compared to workforce housing, where in workforce housing, there is significantly higher rental demand. And people might not have the wherewithal to be able to buy their own home. And so they're going to continue to rent. And that's one of the basic tenets of risk mitigation and decreasing risk that attracts JWB clients to workforce housing neighborhoods. Let's go there. You started kind of just talking about like juxtaposing the qualities of the assets, right? So mm -hmm. like you mentioned one, one is rent to price ratio. You, you mentioned it, that luxury homes have a lower rent to price ratio, AKA your rent in comparison to what your mortgage is, mm -hmm. is not going to be, is, is less favorable, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yes. And what does that predicate? What does that predicate? I don't know if it predicates the rent. I was rent like, oh man, is that I like an don't... SAT word that I, <laughs> I didn't understand exactly? <laughs> you know, it is an SAT word and I don't understand it either. I'm not really sure why I used it. I think he's making me nervous over here, his handsome smile. So rent to price ratio, what does that mean? As so, far as performance? Yeah. Rent to price ratio is a, is a, you know, an easy way to look at a property and say, is this in the ballpark of paying for itself every single month? Because if you're, you know, if you've got a million dollar home out there and it's renting for, you know, $3,000 a month, th there's no way that when you factor in the cost of the mortgage, plus the cost of the insurance and the property taxes and, and everything else that goes along with mm -hmm. owning a rental property, there's no way that each month you're going to have enough to pay for the expenses coming from the rents. And so you can just look at what the rent is and look at what the market value of your home is and say, well, is this even somewhat close? You know, to put it in perspective, you know, the rent to price ratio in workforce housing neighborhoods might be about 0.6% or somewhere around there. So, you know, if you're in luxury houses, I'm just off the top of my head, it's a lot lower than that, right? So if you're in 0.6 to 0.7%, you're in workforce housing, that's an easy way for you to say, okay, well, especially with JWB neighborhoods, that's where I know that this can this thing can pay for itself mm -hmm. and reduce my risk so that this is not something that I have to go negative every single month. And when you get to luxury housing, that's the first decision that you're faced with is, yeah. well, each is it worth it for me to make this investment knowing that I'm going to spend thousands each month just to hold on each and every single month, which... I don't like that. Do you like that? No, I'm not crazy about that. No. So, so rent to price ratios essentially meaning how much of your mortgage is your rent likely to cover mm -hmm. higher in workforce housing, mm -hmm. which means that it's a higher likelihood that your mortgage plus then some is covered and you're making positive cash flow lower in luxury homes. Exactly. There's another another difference in these two asset classes that I think became really apparent to me during COVID, and it's like the volatility. Of, of of the demand. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, when you're supporting these types of individuals who are essential workers, there is inherent risk mitigation just in the people that you're serving, 
right? If you think about our job as an investor is to create a great living experience for the, the resident, then you're serving that population of essential workers. They're essential workers. They're called essential workers because we need them mm -hmm. in all types of weather. And we've seen that from COVID. We've seen that in many different things that we've endured as a country over the last 10 years, right? We love our essential workers. You know, and that's not to say that we don't love others, but what I can say is that, you know, if you're a high income earner, your job may be more at risk. If you are one who may be living in a luxury neighborhood, mm -hmm. you might have a job that might not be quote unquote essential to the operations of our community. Yeah. And inherently, there's more risk associated with that type of a job than nurses, teachers, firefighters, police officers. And so what this does is this creates a very stable job base and those folks need a great place to live. And so your assets are more and more demand in demand and there's less risk associated with rents going down or vacancies happening simply because of who we're serving. That's interesting, man. I hadn't thought about it from the job perspective. I was thinking about something else, which I'll talk about right now, but it makes me think of this idea that we just went through a white collar recession. Yeah, right? like exactly. The idea, we did a show on that. Yeah, we just did a show on that. And like the fact that like the tech sector is kind of like the canary in the mine. They all, you know, there was a ton of layoffs in the tech sector, but I don't really, but our economy is still crushing it. Yeah. Right? You know, like yeah. I don't, I'm not poking fun at the tech sector, right. right? But like the economy is doing really, really well. Unemployment is really low. And yet I still hear about layoffs and despair inside the tech sector because at the end of the day, that is the that is the part of the economy that like that likes to get like overinflated and underinflated and overpriced and whatnot. Right. It's more but opportunistic. Lot, yeah. So likely to lose a job. I was thinking more along the lines of the disposable income side of it that we've talked about, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that if I am, like you said, if I am renting a luxury home on the beach or or even just luxury apartments close to the beach, like what I was doing over the last five years, right. this whole time I have had the option to move closer to the closer to the urban core right buy a home for much cheaper and have a lower mortgage payment than my actual rent is but i chose to rent at rent where i want to live and invest in these in, in in these neighborhoods right so that was a that was a choice for me right whereas folks that rent in workforce housing it's not so much a choice. It is their best option. It is right? their like, best option. Yeah it, it is their best option and that is what they're hoping to do. And even more the folks that are, if I all of a sudden hit really hard economic times and I couldn't continue to live, you know, like, and I was like really looking at my expenses and I lost my job and whatnot, then I would have gone from luxury apartment back to workforce housing mm -hmm. to lower my monthly expenses. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's like this like insulated asset class where the demand for it comes from the folks that always demand it. And in hard times, whoop, it pulls demand from another sector that, you know, insulates it from like the fluctuations yeah. we're talking about. It's risk mitigation. Any way you look at it, workforce housing is risk mitigation. The weird thing is that through a different lens, people look at owning rental properties and they think workforce housing may be more risky yeah. than luxury houses. This is where our not your average perspective comes into play. Uh, because I can tell you that luxury houses are more risky uh, because when we first started 18 years ago, I didn't all know all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I tried to rent out uh, luxury houses. Mm -hmm. And I know what the pain of spending a few thousand dollars a month times 20, 30, 40, however many we had at that point, it was not fun. It was speculative. So that switch of what real risk is and how to mitigate it is important. And I did want to make one other point too. I just needed to share these numbers again, because I do feel like there is a negative stigma around when we say workforce housing. Mm -hmm. And it's not not accurate, right? When we're talking about workforce housing, we're talking about homes and folks that are living in these neighborhoods that are making median income or sometimes up to 120% of median yeah. income, yeah. right? So when we say things like this is their best option, that is not, I don't want that to have the negative stigma. Like this is not a good option. It just happens to be their best option, yeah. right? As as a housing provider, no matter where you are, people are always going to make the decision for it to be their best option, Yeah. right? But for some reason, there's this negative stigma, right? We're not talking about low income here. There is a very big difference between low income 
and workforce housing. And, and there's a reason we don't go to low income as well. It's because you start to see more risk yeah. from maintenance costs, vacancy costs, crime, other things of that nature. So just want us all to- make Yeah, sure when you said that, that figure of like up to 90 grand a year, I was like, oh, okay. You know, right. This is a mid-level manager. This is, you know, like different, different kinds of, it's a different- I think the stigma that you're talking about is that low-income housing stigma that's like elevated crime, maybe less reliable payments from folks because mm -hmm. they're living paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. more so. This sector seems to be the what what I like to call the Goldilocks zone, right? Like it's just kind of like, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's just right. It's just right. Right. Like the porridge. Anything else from a conceptual level before we jump into the data, GC? No, I think we're good. Okay, cool. Well, as you are accustomed to here on the Not Your Average Investor Show, it's not just perspective that we show. We also show data. This is the latest, this is the latest report that came out, October 2021. Yeah. They came out with a study of the fastest growing neighborhoods in Florida. GC, what do we want to know about this? Yeah, this is from Zillow. And this is the first time I've seen them break it down on a neighborhood level of the fastest growing neighborhoods. So I thought this was like godsend for me and for JWB and for, for proving the point you've been trying to prove yeah, forever. Because it's really yeah. hard to get neighborhood specific data that is trusted and that wow. is macro level. You know, we have all this data when we look at how these neighborhoods have have uh, performed and and all that. So I thought this was great. But but this report came out in 2021. What it did is it looked at every neighborhood in the state of Florida and it identified the 21 fastest growing neighborhoods. And the data that came from that was really convenient, we'll say. <laughs> so next slide. <laughs> so out of the data. This is 21, 21 markets, nine of them in Jackson. Exactly. Right. Well, yeah. 21 neighborhoods, nine of them in Jacksonville. Thank you. Out of the 21 neighborhoods, five cities. Only five cities made yeah. the list. And of those cities, nine of the neighborhoods were in Jacksonville. But it gets better and better. The fastest growing neighborhoods in the state of Florida, nine of them were here. And I just want you to see, I'm not going to tell you exactly about this neighborhood yet. Um, well, I will. These are JWB neighbors, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. But we're going to talk a little bit about what type of neighborhood it is. Is it workforce housing? Is it luxury housing? You know where it's, those ships are going to, ships are going to sail from there. Uh, but these are neighborhoods and they're the names that we may call them if you live in town here, right? Lackawanna, Mix in town. This is all what we would call Jacksonville's, or excuse me, JWB's four core neighborhoods here. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I see that's very obvious is normally on Google Maps where you see the city name, that's the urban core. There you go. <laughs> you know, this is downtown yep. where we're going to be spending some time on Saturday here on the Not Average Investor Summit. And these are surrounding neighborhoods to downtown, right? Exactly. Workforce neighborhoods surrounding the urban core that are surrounded by jobs and opportunity for, for, this, uh, for this buying power, right? Exactly. All right. So let's talk about these characteristics. So I wanted to help you guys see what are the differences in types of neighborhoods. And if you are maybe maybe a newer investor or maybe a little bit more savvy, you might have heard of different characteristics. A neighborhoods, B neighborhoods, C neighborhoods, and D neighborhoods. It's an easy way to kind of characterize the qualities of a neighborhood. And so you can look at home price level, income level, the age of the homes, school ratings, amenities, and then violent crime. These are just things that I chose to help give you a picture of what an A neighborhood looks like versus a B, C, or a D. When we're talking about luxury housing, we're talking about A neighborhoods, right? So think of the age of the homes being young, right? So new construction is very common. Think of the best school ratings. Think of the home prices as being the highest. And in terms of violent crime, there's, there's a very low amount of violent crime in your class A neighborhoods. As you start to look over into class B neighborhoods, that's where your above middle income neighborhoods are. So the home prices are still high, higher than the, the median, mm -hmm. but they're not as high as A. School ratings are generally still very good. Your age of homes, you have a little bit more of a mix of new construction and renovations. And of course, your violent crime is still rare in your, in your B neighborhoods. Your class C is where that workforce housing is. The Goldilocks zone. That is the Goldilocks zone. But if you're just looking at this graph right here, you might not say that that is not that is just right, right? Let's look at what these characteristics are. This is this different lens that we have to have when we're identifying what is a not your average investment for you. So you've got home prices, which are below the middle, which is great. Your income levels are below the middle, which 
okay, if prices are lower, lower than the middle, we can deal with that. You've got older homes generally. Uh, your school ratings, which I hear a lot. Oh, is it okay for me to invest in the neighborhood that doesn't have the great school ratings? Well, in workforce housing, guess what, everybody? You're not going to have A-rated schools, right? It is a part of investing in workforce housing. So they're below average to low school ratings. Um, generally, you don't have amenities. So there's not, you know, fantastic shopping dis um, destinations around. And then uh, violent crime is still very rare in these neighborhoods. Class D, on the other hand, is where we would call low income. So low house price, low income level, older homes, low school ratings, no amenities. And yes, there is a higher rate of violent crime in the Class D neighborhoods. Got it. And then this is what it kind of looks like, right? This like A, B, C, and D. Exactly. Right? So this looks a lot like the first home. But if we just started this conversation, and maybe you all can ask this to yourselves and answer it for yourselves, right? If we just put these four pictures up in the beginning and said which has more risk, how many of you, if we're being honest, would have said class C has way more risk than class A? So this is this, this shift, right? What I want to help you do is not define risk based on what your eyes see in a pretty picture, right? We need to identify risk based on numbers and look beyond what is just on the surface. And so class C neighborhoods, workforce housing, that's where when you actually start to peel back the layers, risk mitigation is built in by who you're serving, home prices, and the ability for people to continue to have demand for renting in those neighborhoods, no matter what market conditions come our way. Love it, man. You know, my my takeaway here is that it's a supply demand game. There's two types of supply. There's like the, there's a the housing supply and the resident that wants to live there. And then there's the job supply and the income supply for the resident themselves. Right. And this idea of workforce housing being in this like Goldilocks zone of always having very stable demand, right? Like it's not a very elastic demand. It's always there. Right. The jobs that they tend to work at are pretty stable jobs that, you know, are always going to be spent on in good times and in bad healthcare, school, military, stuff like that. And this message of risk mitigation as an investor to me is very, very attractive, right? Like, and then beyond that, it's the it's the price to rent ratio, right? Mm -hmm. Like the idea that the when it's in this zone, then it hits that sweet spot of rent and price that I can afford that makes it very approachable for like a normal person like me to get it. Absolutely. Let's and we haven't even talked about another large advantage for focusing on workforce housing from the investor perspective. How about the fact that it costs significantly less to get into this asset, yeah. right? If you're thinking about investing in luxury housing, housing prices are probably going to be about $550,000 in Jacksonville. That's going to be a down payment of, call it around $175,000 to $200,000. Mm -hmm. So the threshold, the barrier even to get into luxury housing, even if it had less risk, yeah. even if it was a better investment, it was going to cost you twice as much to get into it. So- you know, all of these things com combined really make this workforce housing asset better on risk mitigation. But I also wanted to point out that it's not just risk mitigation. This is another misconception. Many people look at the picture of A, B, C, D types of houses, mm -hmm. and in their mind, they say, well, class A must appreciate more than class C. And guys, the data doesn't show that. And that's what this Zillow data, that's why the Zillow data was so incredible. It's because, now this is from 2021, it's the last time they've done the study, but the fastest growing, that's another way of saying the highest appreciation has actually come from class C neighborhoods in the entire state of Florida. The number one neighborhood for home price appreciation was a class C neighborhood. All nine neighborhoods in Jacksonville that were nine of the 21 fastest growing neighborhoods in all the state of Florida, none of those are in luxury. Yeah. All nine were in class C neighborhoods, which is where JWB has been investing for 18 years, which is where we put all of our clients. So when I saw all of this data to support what we have been saying for such a long time, I thought it would help give a little bit more credence yep. behind not just that this is a less risky place to be, but there is also more upside here. 
Yeah. The kicker here is you just have to train your mind to think differently. You cannot make pictures be the decision making for you. You have to get comfortable with somebody looking at what you're investing in and saying, really, you're investing in that? Yeah. You know, yeah. you if you can get over that, you get all these other benefits. Yeah. And so you hopefully know, this helps. When you talk benefits right now, GC, I can't help but think about this idea of of impact and how, you know, we're, we've got the summit coming up and we've, we've been preparing and it's this painting this picture that real estate investing, real estate development doesn't have to be a win-lose. doesn't have to be a win-win. It can be a win-win-win, right? right? Like we can create multiple wins. And what I'm hearing a lot here is, and I keep hearing about is the affordability crisis. Things are, things are getting more expensive for the average American and when I think about workforce housing, I think of it as like the solution for this, right? Exactly. Like we need more of these assets. We need more people to fund these assets in order to build them, in order to house the folks, because people that are starting families, right? Like young millennials, Gen Zs right now, they some of them don't think that there is a housing stock for them. Right. You know, like they don't see it happening for them. People are getting pinched everywhere. And and the need for this for this asset class to exist and to do well and to have companies that are real professionals and world-class companies managing them to me, I think is a, is a macro huge thing that, you know, as an investor, it doesn't affect my pocketbooks, but it makes me feel good. It should make you feel good. Yeah. It is the number one problem facing our country is housing affordability. And to know that you're a part of the solution should make you feel good. You're a big part of the solution, especially when you invest in a JWB property, because when you start to invest in a JWB property, you're not just doing this to make your life better. You're making more housing available in the area that is most needed, right? There's the only one way that JWB can build over 400 homes this year. And it's through your investments. That's what keeps the lights on around here. So every time you make an investment to buy a JWB rental property, you're helping to solve the housing affordability crisis. And beyond that, what many people don't understand is not only do we sell homes to investors at JWB, we're the largest provider of affordable housing for sale inventory in our neighborhoods as well. Retail, your retail brand. We could, yes, yeah. retail. We sell about half of our homes to owner occupants and they're in the same exact neighborhoods. If you run a search on the multiple listing service for housing that costs less than $300,000 in Jacksonville, you're going to see JWB homes over and over and over. We, we sold the most on a percentage basis out of anybody else in Jacksonville last year to folks living in workforce housing neighborhoods. So that's what you're a part of. And I don't think that many people understand the ramifications. They look at it or they might have preconceived notions about investing in workforce housing. But guys, you are doing so much good by investing where you are. And I want you to feel really good about it. Good message, man. Good message. So if you want to feel really good about investing, go to chatwithjwb.com and start your investing journey, right? Or shoot a, an email to info at jwbcompanies.com, right? JWB companies. Well done, brother. I don't always You've only been doing this for four years. I so. don't get that email right every time. It is not a guarantee. What is a guarantee? is that we have a lively community. We Let's bring them on in. House. All right, so we got a couple of questions here. We got Shaquille Ahmed, who is dangerously becoming a regular out I, here. I've liked that. <laughs> is it fair to say that Class C generally has medium to high default in rents and churn? What do you say to that, GC? No. Well, you know, I'll certainly answer it. And, and I know Lee <laughs> wants to answer it too. You know, it's interesting. There's so much that is just kind of like natural perception based on the way I don't know, based on a lot of things that's really not based in, in data, right? If you start to think about macro here, investing in workforce housing is a rental base that has significantly higher demand. Many times because folks who are in workforce housing do not have the ability to actually buy a home. Yes. And it's really hard to go from a situation where you can't buy a home mm -hmm. to a situation where you can buy a home. Yep. You have to have a lot more income your credit has to get a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other things have to go your way. So it's a big step up. So, you know, actually in workforce housing, because of that rental demand and because of the type of folks that we're serving and because of how hard it is to take that step to actually being a homeowner, you generally have residents that, residents that stay a longer period of time. Mm. So that's one thing that doesn't get talked a lot about. Now, you know, on the hand, on the other side, on the other hand, 
you know, there is a difference between how people take care of homes, generally speaking, when it is a nicer neighborhood, when it is a more luxury neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, we all know that when people own their own home, they generally take better care of the home than when they rent it. That's just a natural fact. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you experience more maintenance costs because Drew was just talking about that, right? While you do, maybe people generally take care of things a little bit better in the more luxury normal homes. Normal wear and tear, and, and it, there's pretty stuff in there. And just, just normal wear and tear, you've got to put money in to bring things back up to speed. So there's a standard of wear and tear that you're going to be at regardless. But the things in luxury homes cost a lot more to replace than the things that are in workforce housing. And so, you know, I, I would I would give alternative perspectives and a little bit more color than just on that idea that things are all and, gonna be more turnover. And you put the things in the houses that are harder to tear up, right? The hard floor and no garbage disposal, mm. things of this nature. So you're doing a lot of floor planning for that, for the you know, the turns. I and mean, I, even the refrigerator didn't have a handle on it. How about when that? We huh? went in there, I was like, why, why is there no handle? Well. That's the first thing it breaks. Yeah. So we're like, oh, I never thought of that, but JWB did. How about, <laughs> how about value engineering a home to where you can create a great experience for the resident, but you don't have to have things that generally break because when a small thing breaks and you have to call the service repair person to go over, that might be a trip charge of $100 right off the bat. Yeah. Right. You know? One, one thing about the turns as well, moving is a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. Most people don't want to move. And the nice thing sure. about you guys is you treat the tenants so well, they don't have that or I'm not treating, well, I want to get out of here. It's like, hey, I'm being treated well. This is a nice place. And it's just easy to just settle into that. And Absolutely. every year, the other thing people don't think about is every year they try and move to a different place and get the, you know, they get their credit searched. Mm -hmm. And annually getting your credit search hurts your credit score. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't think about that. But so, you know, being able to provide multi-year Leases for residents is awesome. And, you know, and the, the average stay of your residence four and a half years. You didn't mention that. Too. So, right. You guys are doing a great job. <laughs> you guys want to just take a residence stay here? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's answering Jim Kirko's question. Where is, it, is there a difference in length of the average lease term in the different asset classes? You just answered it, right? JWB in workforce housing has four and a half year average stay. Do we have any data on the average stay on the other asset classes? I don't know. Yeah. We, we don't rent. What, you know, to and, the luxury and I would say that they'd be tough to do that because most of the other asset claims, you're in A and B. These are people that are renting temporarily because they're looking to buy something. True. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and that's a lot of operator specific information. I there, mean, so I fall into that. I'm I'm renting a class housing right True. now because I'm building right down the street. You know, but boom, I'm I'm gone in ten months yeah. because my new house. This is going to be done. Yeah. yeah. It's it's not four and a half years. I can tell you that. Yeah. On no. right. Yeah. And higher income is also, you know, moving is expensive. So right. if you're higher income, like you can afford to move tell more. Than, yeah, tell me about my, it. Now. God, I price that. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I talked to one of my neighbors. He, he moved to Margaritaville from, yeah. from Oregon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. $33,000 yeah. to move. To move. Yeah. 33. I said, oh, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. Moving across state especially is. Lee, Lee anec anecdotally, right? So we're just talking about tenant stays, turnover, default payments. How many properties do you own? Four. Uh, five, but... Five. Payments, payments on time, turnover, about how many of those are you are you having I've these I've only days? had two turns so far, and I've owned them since 2019. Since 2019. Yeah. yeah. And my first term was about 1500 bucks, which was awesome. Yeah. Like, you know, Drew was saying, it's, they don't wear and tear beat it up. You yeah. Know? Any issues with on-time payments? Well, during COVID. During COVID a little bit. Well, I mean, what, that was one of the things that everybody was like, oh, man, how can we help the residents, right? Yeah. That was a big topic. And it was awesome to be part of that yeah. right at the beginning because we said we cared about the residents and how can we help them. And JWB came up with a plan to help them make the payments. If they can't make it, then, you know, yeah. make a partial payment, get an insurance program for them and all yeah. that stuff. <laughs> Amazing stuff from JWB. That was cool going yeah. through all that. First hand. And I'll just say, I love hearing that because when we ask about, you asked about receiving payments during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think most investors would immediately talk about the themselves, right? We talked about the resident. How do we take care of the resident? This is the type of client that we are blessed to be around, right? Yeah. You know, it's, and this is this triple win that we talk about often, yeah. right? We can create some great things. We can change the world when we help 
others, when we help everybody else lift themselves up a little bit more. One and, neighborhood at a time. And and right. that's, you know, and that's what we're and, doing here. And right. yes, and basically happy clients basically take better care of your property and stay right. longer. Mm -hmm. It's right. that simple. Yeah. Drew, how many are you up to these days? I have five. Five also. Yes. Yeah, you guys are just. And so, I had one that had, had a couple of turns, yeah. nothing uh, outlandish. Mm -hmm. And then there was one property that I did have a turn, turn on, but that was one we knew we were going to have some issues with. JWB actually gave me a $12,000 credit on the, on the, on the turn. Okay. When I bought it, it was, it was in there. And that actually, we could have done the whole thing, but I actually chose to, to spend a, a little bit more to get the hard flooring throughout that thing so I could turn because it, it had some carpeting in it and we were going to do the new carpet. I said, you know, there's no sense in that. Just let's just do the hard flooring. I'll, I'll, I'll shell out the extra, you know, a uh, couple of grand. And that way it just lasts so much longer in the, you know, for the, for the time. And that, that house has just been great. There you go. I mean, last year when I went and we did the tour and I was kind of like seeing a house, we can't do that this time, but mm -hmm. I got to meet one of my residents and I got one of the girls that we had just talked into buying some houses. Mm -hmm. So she came in with me from yeah. California yeah. and she's seeing a three, two. Yeah. And I'm talking to the resident. I said, how do you like the house? He said, Oh my God. He said, this is the exact house I wanted to buy. He's a, you know, he said, I love this house. He's been there since 2019. Mm -hmm. I said, do you have any issues? You know what he said? My mother won't stay here because the water smells like sulfur. Mm. So I said, oh, man, yeah. does JWB know? Mm -hmm. He said, no. So when I came back, mm -hmm. I said, how much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. You guys said 1500 bucks. I said, do it. Nice. Right? I said, nice. just do it. Yeah. Right? If it's well water and it tastes like sulfur, yeah. you know, Absolutely. let's get your mother to stay here when yeah. she comes yeah. visit, yeah. right? Yeah. It's going to make him want to stay longer? Sure. And I think that pot, that's going to repay me in the end, you know. Yeah, sure. You can, you can do do good things. He did not know that I was well. the owner because I was like, have you ever talked to the owner? He's yeah. like, no. I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> right. That's good. We usually keep it separate there. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. I think that's, that's why, right? I don't want to be. Nah. Yeah. A lot of it is, is, <laughs> the, it was awesome. is the shift in mentality also. You've got to, some things you got to look at as not as an expense, but as he said, as an investment right. that will pay you back. And that was, right. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure that guy's going to stay for a couple more years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I hope so. All right. Well, I want to go grab some lunch with you guys. Any, any, well, what are you most looking forward to? You were here not that long ago. No, probably nine months. Nine months ago. What are you most looking forward to in the summer right now? Basically, just I got to meet Lee. Right? Oh, just right right now. Now. We have not, no. we can't miss each other. It's great. Yeah. And just the wonder, just, I mean, hanging out with wonderful people, you know, see a Dean again. Yeah. Of course, Jen was actually at my place yesterday. Yeah. She was driving up from That's Melbourne. Right. She stopped by and saw yeah. my new house and yeah. everything like that. Yeah. You know, just, just the wonderful people in this community. I just love hanging I mean, out. I think you know? this whole community yeah. and, and definitely the meetup. Which has become the summit really started with you and Jen. Yep. And right? Renee, we we and met in Atlanta. Atlanta. That was that first That's one. Right. And Woodstock, Georgia. Yeah. 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 Well, Woodstock is Atlanta. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. You know that's, a lot of people don't understand. Atlanta has six million people, but don't, less than half a million of them live in the city yeah, limits yeah, of Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just a bunch of whole little, you know. Yeah. But yeah, she she was just in there and it was on the show. She mentioned she was in Atlanta. And I said, Hey, I live in right. Atlanta. And she says, Hey, well, let's hang out. And we did and that was the first JWV meetup. That's right. That's right. Years ago. What about you, Lee? What are you the most looking forward to? Meeting. There's going to be a lot of people have already been saying, I, I can't wait to meet you. And I was surprised last year when it was like that because we were in Sweet Peds. Yeah. And people were going, Let, let's get a picture with you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, great, man. That's a Ruby star, right? Yes. I was like, what the hell? Listen, get a picture with the MVP. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> There's a handful, there's a handful of folks in our community, like the two of you that have really invested time and effort and really have given a lot of yourselves. And as a result, I think that people see you as people of value, well, right? Part of it also, when I did the first meeting yeah. that we had down, I remember we were on the beach there, Casa Marina, then, yeah, yeah. Casa Marina and everything like that, is I got to meet you and Pablo. And that just gave me, elevated my comfort level mm -hmm. because- you know, you are a genuine person and come across, you know, like I said, you're, you, you know, it, you spend enough time around somebody and you, you get, you get to know whether they're, you know, yeah, whether they're basically a con artist or if they're a genuine person. I've got to know you as a really a genuine person and that really cares and is cares about people, cares about the business and right. cares about all of us. And and I've right, always right. appreciated that. I appreciate that comes across. Words, that comes across. I mean, it, the, the access to you on the show, you know, we're sending stuff on the chat and Pablo, Reads through it, 
<laughs> edits some of it, makes it presentable and PG, you know, but I, I just love what the, you know, the community is really all about family, right? I mean, yeah. this whole group has the same mentality, has the same mindset, no matter who you talk to, no matter how many times you talk to them. And everybody, when you talk to them new, you're like, you already know them, you know, like Drew coming in saying, <laughs> I finally get to meet you, yeah, but yeah. it feels like we know each other. You know, well, so that's that's cool. Yeah, and 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 I, I kind of understand that because literally I have you know I work in Zoom, so I mean yeah. I've only met one person in real life that actually works for me at the company I work for. Yeah. And when you do that, it's a little bit surreal, but but you develop a relationship in you know in, in a video, and it's you know after five minutes, it's like okay, I always know you, you know. And these guys see you. Everybody in the audience sees you guys like twice a week, so for them to not feel like they know you already. Yeah, you talk business, you have things that you need to t discuss. But when it comes time to a little ad lib, a little impromptu, and then they see behind the curtain and they say, my God, he's he's like that. You know, what's Pablo really like? Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. You'll find out. We'll you'll find a lot of time to do that. Give the karaoke mic. You'll see my, you see my soul. <laughs> you see my soul. All right. Well, right along, Raj is saying this looks like a love festival. It is, Raj. This is going to be a love festival no, <laughs> for the next 48 hours of this summit. I can't wait to do it. Of course, we got awesome shows next week. We'll have a recap of the summit on Thursday. We're doing a Not Your Average Insights on Tuesday. And any advice from now till then, gentlemen? Don't be don't average. Don't be average. <laughs> be average.